And Joe Roman was very articulate today when we met with the uh, Cleveland Ed, uh, Plain Dealer Ed Board about how the more cooperation we can get from these just institutions that have reputation, good reputations around the world, working together, collaborative degrees, in-state tuition for both sides if they're public. I mean, how to, how to work all these different scenarios. But that's, that's it. I mean, that's what, you're ta that's what we're talking about. Those kind of issues, institutions, nonprofits, businesses, chambers of commerce, you know, educate everything. So, not enough is the answer. And I would add that when I talk about what are the policies that we can implement on a national level that can benefit us as a region, education is certainly one of them. YSU has taken a huge step in experimenting with the idea of allowing people from the near Pennsylvania border to come over and consider that in-state tuition. We need to do more of that. We need to make it easier for colleges and universities and community colleges to do that, career schools. But also, when we move forward with education, we need to find a way to allow sharing of educational expertise and professional expertise so that if Carnegie Mellon has people on staff that can work some time at other colleges and universities around our region talking about engineering, then let's do that. If Case Western has some expertise that is not available in the Pittsburgh area to students who go to school there, let's come up with a way that we can have a sharing arrangement. And that would be very unique. So we always think about ways that we can help make that easier in the law and then try to have our region in the forefront to take advantage of it. Hi, um, I'm from the Montessori High School University Circle, and I'm wondering where the funding for high schools fit into your plans. Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Ohio. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm on the Education Committee as well. No Child Left Behind, which I'm sure you heard of, is a name. What No Child Left Behind is, is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is the five-year reauthorization for funding for elementary and secondary funding in the country. No Child Left Behind was to expire in 2007. And to not get into political arguments or great detail uh, into what your question was, we were unable to agree with President Bush on what the future will be for the public education system. And we decided that we would be much better off dealing with President Obama than we were with President Bush. So we reauthorized it in the short term, kicked it into March of 2009. We're going to get right to work working on all these issues. But we cannot move forward as a country, as a nation, if we don't continually improve our public education system. Everybody knows that. Your question was about funding. Just throwing money at schools doesn't solve the problem because some of the highest funded per capita schools in the country, unfortunately, get some of the worst results. If you look around, you'll find that to be the case. And some of the schools that don't have the federal funding get some of the best results. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but that is a problem that exists. So we want to move forward and create policies that allow schools to be innovative and competitive with the rest of the world. I'm sure you're not in this category, but if you poll students in this country, unbelievable percentages fail history. Can't put the Civil War chronologically within 50 <coughs> years. Can't tell you which came first, the Revolution or the Civil War. Can't tell you whether Abraham Lincoln was before Franklin Roosevelt. These are things that we need to correct. So part of No Child Left Behind is going to be to put in place the ability of schools to think more creatively, as your schools do, to help our students move forward and be competitive in the global economy. Because as I said, we're not competing with just America. We're competing with the rest of the world. I'd just like to add to that uh, part in the stimulus package. And in the future, there's going to be money for construction. Um, there's also uh, some incentives uh, through bond issues that we're also trying to create to put money to make sure that the facilities are there. It's not necessarily speaking to um, the program, but to the construction of a lot of these schools uh, that we all know uh, needs to get done. And then one, one comment I have, too, on, on the uh, area of education. I think we need to, as a country, really figure out and get creative in researching how we teach our kids. 
and how kids are responding to the kind of teaching. And uh, there's some work going on right now at the University of Illinois in Chicago on, it's called Cassell. It's a collaborative on academic, social, and emotional learning. A lot of these kids come to school in no shape to learn. And we have to figure out how we can help these kids process what they're going through in their home life, in their neighborhoods, before they get to school. Your frontal lobes process your working memory and your emotions. So if you see traumatic experiences at home, and then you sit in a desk, and you can't learn, it's because it's the same area of your brain, and your brain in many ways is literally scrambled. So you don't have the working memory to do well in math, to do well in English, or whatnot. So as a country, we've got to figure out how we invest into these programs, how we research them, and the studies that they're doing with this uh, emotional learning, it's based on the book Emotional Intelligence that Dan Goldman wrote a few years back, 11 to 17 percentile point increase in students who are participating in this kind of curriculum. It's something we need to look into, but it needs to be an overall approach of innovation in education. Congressman Ryan, uh, in your remarks, you recited a number of billions of dollars being allocated to various agencies uh, in the new stimulus plan. Most of us are extremely disappointed to see what happened to the TARP, uh, that uh, money was supposed to be used for one purpose and like a beautiful shell game, it went somewhere else. What mechanisms are in place, in Washington at least, to coordinate the distribution of these funds so we're not just stepping one over another. These funds are all going to be distributed, and I share your concern, and I know Congressman Almeyer does as well with the TARP money, the, the, the very high level of frustration, and we're fixing that for the second tranche that's going through. Um, but all the money that's going to go through in the stimulus package, most of it, will be through uh, existing formula uh, that the states have or local governments have or the federal government has. So there are already existing programs that the money will be pumped through, which I think will provide the necessary safeguards. And I would say on the transportation infrastructure funding, which is a large portion of it, just as one example, these are programs that have to be what's called shovel ready. You've probably heard that term. And that's defined as within 90 days, you can start putting a shovel in the ground. So the environmental work has been done. All the clearance has been done. There's no red tape. And these are projects, in many cases, that are already underway or about to become underway. And that's not pork. That's not a bridge to nowhere. These are projects that have already been approved and judged to be of sufficient need. So we're hopeful with the way that this has been put into place. There's accountability there to address the problems that you're talking about. And we're going to be able to finish these programs and put people back to work and not have the same problems that the TARP program had. Congressman Ryan, uh, would you uh, make a pledge here to continue this support once you represent the entire state of Ohio? <laughs> Should that happen, I will be supportive. <laughs> Relative to the rest of the country, the um, Cleveland, Youngstown, Pittsburgh corridor is um, heavily unionized. So my question to both of you is, um, does organized, what's the role for organized labor in the new Tech Belt initiative? Is it uh, marginalized as part of the past, or does it play a role in the future? I think organized labor has a, a major role. And one of the things we didn't get into was the, the green manufacturing um, and the opportunities that are presented here. And a good example is Parker Hannafin, who's uh, obviously a well-known company here. Uh, make the hydraulics, uh, steel workers union, um, those hydraulics go in the windmills. 